come in. When that yeah. door starts opening, uh, they are standing you see, by. You see people from the sports information office kind of looking in, looking back out, shaking their heads. So they're trying to work this out so they can bring them out. Uh, it is 10 a.m. right now, so this news conference should take place any moment. Uh, if you, if you noticed a moment ago some of the live pictures from outside the athletic complex as well. Uh, fans have gathered there um, wanting to get a glimpse. Uh, it's, um, it's been like this since the Saban family arrived in Tuscaloosa yesterday afternoon. Right. I, I've, I've been through numerous coaches here since 89 when I came to this city, and uh, never before have I had so many calls from viewers asking if they could carry a tripod or carry a battery and help <laughs> me and help our crew <laughs> inside help today to get a seat and, and, and pretty much get the a crew me down while was. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, but we were uh, talking about some of the fans' reactions and, and how ex extreme it seemed, like a rock star was, uh, you know, arriving. <laughs> But I, a couple of the phone callers on, on the local sports shows yesterday, one of them said, um, the shepherd has come to lead the flock. <laughs> I mean, they really talk about this in religious terms. Well, and Janice, you're and me, uh, but, but Nick Saban is, a, is an attractive, he's a handsome man. Uh, this isn't... Uh, a so wimpish looking coach. Football. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think he's going to be, he, he's got great charisma, and uh, he is a winner, and uh, I understand through my ex exclusive sources that he'll be wearing a houndstooth hat at the press conference. Wow, <laughs> that would be something. <laughs> that would be something. You know, uh, you know, let me go back to what, and well, the door's opening, I keep By the way, those seats over there, see. that, those, those will be for the family and the president and the board of trustees. If you remember from the Shula press conference, uh -huh. that shot of the President Witt staring at Sherry Shula. <laughs> Let's go back to what we were talking about, some of that negative publicity that's been out there, some of the negative uh, reporting on it, as far as, as the, the pay uh, here of Nick Saban. Uh, already we're seeing others lining up that appear to be in line to get hefty pay raises this month and beyond. Um, what does this do, and we may be interrupted here, but what does, uh, what does the, the Saban hiring do? I mean, suddenly a new standard that everybody's going to be paying their coaches It's interesting, once Bob, again. St Bob Stoops uh, at, at Oklahoma uh, is the highest paid coach. He gets one more dollar than, than uh, Saban. Members Those are the Board, board of, of trustees, trustees right there. But anyway, you were saying? Uh, Paul Bryan Jr., yeah. as you're seeing, walking in the door. It's going to be interesting to see what he has to say. These are the, the board. Which but doesn't I, I, say I, a lot. You know, yeah, he no, doesn't pa say a Paul Bryan uh, says very little. Uh, it's interesting how uh, some of these people were not necessarily in favor of getting rid of Shula a couple weeks ago, they had a pretty dramatic turn of events, uh, but uh, the board is now see, but back to your question, uh -huh. Rick, uh, it's, you're going to hear a lot of uh, chatter from uh, the typical sections of, uh, of academia blasting this, uh, but they do that every time. They blasted it when, when the going price was $2 million as opposed to $4 million. Well, I think you mentioned uh, where does, I forgot who said, it may, have, it may have been Cecil Hurt this morning said, you know, where does a million stop? I mean, where do you go from, what's the difference in two point something million for really Auburn as, and as, three point as, something as, for somebody else? To a certain extent, there were criticisms when Saban was the, the highest paid at LSU and then Stoops came in and got his, uh, his pay. So there has, it has kind of just continues, the stair, the stair steps as, yeah. the, as the salary getting uh, salary. You know, the same people, who, the presidents may criticize this, but they're also making billion dollar deals with networks like Fox for the BCS. Right with CBS for the NCAA, that's right. and uh, that's the world we live in nowadays. And, and the athletic department at Alabama cleared about $70 million last year, and, and of course that's all sports, but primarily it's all football, let's face it. So, you know, you're paying a guy 3.7 to make 70. I mean, I'm not, but, a, I'm not a big CEO, but well, I too, think that's a pretty good return. Well, you think about this, too. You're not, you, in the pros, you're paying football players a lot more money, sure. and you don't pay anybody on the team to play this, so not I guess that, not the... Not that we know of. It it's become, well. it, it's <laughs> become a, a game now, and that's how Shula got his raise. If Tuberville's making two and a half, I can, how can I live, Shula's friend said, on, on a measly $850,000 a year, so they kicked him up to nearly two million. And, and if you're a high school recruit, uh, you want to be recruited by the guy who's making four million, not the guy who's making a million and a half. Well, you know, Boise true. State's coach, I think he went, makes 500,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can you live on that? Yeah, how can you live yeah, on that? Can't. You just can't nowadays. Yeah, and I, I will say this. I think there is a big disconnect, though. When you make yeah. $4 million a year, the, the folks at home who make an honest living and, and try to save a couple of bucks for a summer vacation at the beach, they don't relate to this when the coach starts losing. So that's why you hear a lot of the, the criticism and quickly. Oh, I, are the salaries out of control? Absolutely. But then again, you know, I'm under the impression that I, I don't think you can blame Nick Saban for what he's getting. He's got to get what he's got to get. You blame the guys paying him. Yeah, if they don't want to pay him that much, don't pay him that much. And newsflash, politicians getting involved in it, too, because uh, as uh, Paul and I were talking earlier this morning on Good Day Alabama, uh, USA Today piece today talking about uh, House Ways and Commi Means Committee may be uh, calling the NCAA officials in to explain to them 
why coaches are being paid the amounts that they're being paid. And, yeah, and yeah, obviously, a lot of a lot of sound and fury yeah. signifying nothing. Uh, there, there's really not no way they're going to change. Yeah, you it. would think they would have something better to look into than coaches said. I mean, on the big picture, I don't, I don't know. Not yeah. that not that that's a lot of money, not the, that that's out of hand. Well, they're saying they're they're complaining as their palms are being greased by lobbyists. Exactly. You look at pro sports. We're, we're getting gosh, very close. That was the official made. photographer that just walked in. Wow. So uh, Paul Feinbaum with the official officially five minutes. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there we go. All right, there you go. Here they're we starting go. to come in. Oh, okay. what do you think Saban's doing over there? Just kind of is he is he on his cell phone like he was yesterday when he got off Probably the plane? Probably a lot of hands right now. I would imagine in that Probably, back room too. Yeah. He's thanking Rich Rodriguez. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what was that? He said he's thanking Rich thanking Rodriguez. Rich Rodriguez. Hey, uh, two people from the My same er, the same county in West Virginia. That's right. There we go. There's Terry. Wife, Terry. There's Terry Saban. The children. So this, this is slowly happening. Very slowly. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're bringing them in, but it's going to take a moment to get everybody in place. I don't know if we've technically got, we usually get a two-minute warning, a one-minute warning. I don't know if we've really yeah, we, gotten you that are, or not. You are extremely close. You'll see the President, Mal Moore, now they shut the door, as I was saying. that uh, You'll see the President, Mal Moore, and Saban probably uh, coming next. But the family is now seated, and uh, it's nearly showtime, uh, officially six minutes late. 13, thir 13 different moves. Is that crimson? That is crimson. I believe it that is. That is crimson. And she's a, she's, a, she's a sharp lady. She's, she's been around the block, and she was quoted in the Mobile Register this morning by a press register saying, hey, look, uh, you know, that, that, that it's secret to stay married for 35 years to a coach who's moved 13 times. Just make sure he always shares his day with you each and every night, regardless of what time he comes home. And yeah. those are some late nights. So yeah. uh, hats off to that lady. She right used to be there. a teacher. She used to be in real estate. And then mm -hmm. she said, finally, it was time to become a coach's wife full time. And, you know, uh, evidently they're gone a lot. So when he you, comes home, it's important to You think you could be a coach's wife full time on $4 million a year? <laughs> I think I could. <laughs> uh, there's Robert Witt. There's Mal Moore coming in now. There's Nick there Saban. Is. There he is. The new head coach of the University Ty. of Alabama. He made it. And there's the applause people were wondering if you were going to hear today. <clears throat> I first wish to thank uh, our Chancellor, Dr. Patero, our President, Dr. Whit, and the Board of Trustees for their steady support and confidence throughout this process. It could not have been successful without their support. When we began the process of hiring the head coach for the University of Alabama, I stated the express goal was to hire a coach with championship credentials. While a number of outstanding individuals expressed interest in becoming the coach of the Crimson Tide, one person who always stood out was Nick Saban, a man who has coached a team to the pinnacle of college football. His teams always play with confidence and pride. And I know in order to win a national championship, a team has to be mentally as well as physically tough. Coach Saban's teams have always possessed those qualities. Alabama has a long storied football history, complete with memorable moments and time honored players. Importantly, there have been legendary head coaches who, expi who inspired those players to achieve those moments in time. Today we move forward, uh, move toward a future with a new coach who will write his own chapter in Crimson Tide history. And there will be more of these moments that will never be forgotten. As an old football coach, I can tell you Nick Saban is a man who I've admired because of the way his teams play the game. He is a man filled with relentless energy to excel, and he exerts it in shaping his players into being better individuals, as well as the best athletes they can be on the football field. This is a great moment for the University of Alabama. <clears throat> and before I introduce the coach, I would like to take just a moment and, and introduce his family, and, in, and certainly, uh, in introducing Terry to say to you how important she was in the decision that was made by the coach. She loves college football and longed to be back in it. So does Coach Saban. But Terry Saban was the one that uh, 
made me feel good when I called her. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, would you please stand? <coughs> They have a son, Nick Jr., that is not here. He's in college at this time. Their daughter, Kristen, who is a 10th grader. <laughs> and a friend of Kristen's, Nicole, that's in school with her in, in Florida. Welcome to the University of Alabama. <clears throat> and it, it gives me uh, uh, great pleasure to introduce the next coach of the Crimson Tide, Nick Saban. Thank you very much. I can't tell you how pleased and honored I am to be your coach at the University of Alabama. Uh, the spirit and enthusiasm that has been demonstrated to myself and my family has been uh, phenomenal uh, since we arrived here yesterday afternoon. It's certainly appreciated. Uh, but I want you to know that it will be our goal to um, give you the kind of football program, find a kind of football team that you can be proud of and that will complement the tradition uh, that this institution has uh, been so proud of through the years, and that's going to be our goal as a football program. I'd like to th thank Dr. Witt and Mao uh, for extending the wonderful opportunity uh, to my family to be your head coach at the University of Alabama. To the fans and supporters, the boosters, and everybody that's here um, that loves this program and loves Alabama football, uh, I want everybody to know that we need a lot of positive energy uh, for everybody to make a difference in how we go about what we try to do to have the best football team in the Southeastern Conference, the best football program in the Southeastern Conference. And I think everybody should take the attitude that we're working to be a champion that we want to be a champion in everything that we do. Every choice, every decision, everything that we do every day, we want to be a champion. Everyone take ownership for what they need to do relative to their role and whatever it is, whether it's being a fan, being a booster, be a good one. Any kind of supporter that you are for this team, everyone take ownership that we support each other so we can have the best possible football program uh, that Alabama's ever had. And there have been some great ones through the years. but. The tradition here is phenomenal, and that's certainly a standard of excellence uh, that we want to work and make our football program a part of. Our mission statement here is to create an atmosphere and environment for everyone to be able to succeed, first of all, as a person. We want players to be more successful in life because they were involved in our program by the principles and values that we're able to uh, develop with them so that they can be successful relative to the character and attitude that they have as a football player here at this institution. The second thing is, is we want them to be successful with students. Uh, I, I always tell players in recruiting, there's two things that we want you to do here. You've got two careers, one on the field and one off the field. And the one on the field means you've got to graduate from college, and that's the one that's going to have the greatest impact on the quality of your life forever. So we want to have a great academic support program where we want our players to succeed as students. The third thing is we want to be the best possible football players that they can be. Whenever we got here to reach their full potential as a football player, play together as a team, and know how important it is to be a part of a successful team and fulfilling your role to that team. And the last thing is, is to use all the resources that this institution has to help everyone launch their career when they've represented this institution, when they lead this institution, that we help them launch their careers so they can be most successful in life because of their association with this university and the people that have made this university great. So that's what we want to try to accomplish as the football coach here. Now, expectations. I know there's tremendous expectations here for what, you're, what you would like to accomplish with this football program. And I can tell you that however you feel about it, I have even higher expectations for what we want to accomplish. I want to win every game we play. I've never gone out to play a game. We've never gone out to play a game where we didn't want to win, and it wasn't important to win, and we didn't focus on winning and put all our energy into winning. But I think it's more important that you're able to take your expectation and bridge them into the process of what it takes to be successful. And I want to use this as an example. And we won a national championship at LSU 
in 2003, the players developed the goals for the team. And I thought it was interesting that that was the first team that I ever coached that didn't have a goal that was result-oriented, like go to a New Year's Day bowl game or win the SEC championship or some goal that was result-oriented. But this team, the five goals they had, had nothing to do with winning a game. Didn't say anything about results. The first one was, is be a team. Together, everybody can accomplish more. And when I speak to you as fans, boosters, people who love this program, you're a part of that team too. And together, we can accomplish more. It takes trust, respect for each other, and what everyone's role is and what they need to do. So that's the first thing that's important, is for us to work together and use all the resources we have to make this everything that it's capable of being. The second thing was, is work every day to dominate your opponent. And you know, we have an opponent in this state that we work every day, 365 days a year, all right, to dominate. But that's, that's our goal. That's what you get up every day to do, to dominate the people that you have to compete against and play against. Everyone needs to be responsible for their own self-determination. We don't want to point any fingers in any direction other than what we control, what we can do, and I, I would like for everybody that's associated with this team to do the same thing. Be responsible for what your role is and what you need to do. Be positive to affect the team and your teammates. This is a team's goal, but I'm trying to relate them a little bit to the whole big picture of what we're talking about here. Positively affect your teammates every day in the choices and decisions that you make. And then the last one was be a champion. Now this team did that, and they did what? Won the national championship, and I think that's the kind of process that I think you, you can expect from us in terms of how we approach what we do. I'm not going to talk about what we're going to accomplish. We're going to talk about how we're going to do it. Now, what kind of football team that we want to, do we want to have here? You know, we want to be a big, physical, aggressive football team that is relentless in the competitive spirit that we go out and play with week in and week out. And what I would like for every football team to do that we play is to sit there and say, I hate playing against these guys. I hate playing them. Their effort, their toughness, their relentless resiliency to go out every play and focus and play the next play and compete in the game for 60 minutes in the game, I can't handle. Can't handle. That's the kind of football team we want. Now, that takes a lot of conditioning. It takes a lot of preparation. And it takes a mindset that you're going to play for 60 minutes in the game regardless of what the scoreboard says. And you're going to compete that way throughout the game. You know, I've learned a lot about myself in the last two years. You know, I like the pro game. I like the pro players. Had some great relationships with the players that we had at the Miami Dolphins. Had a wonderful owner in Wayne Huizenga, who I truly respect and adore and love as a man as much as anybody except my own father that I've ever met in the world. He came and, and gave me that opportunity, came back on Christmas Eve and talked me into going to the Miami Dolphins when I was going to stay at LSU. And he is a wonderful person and very supportive. But what I realized in the last two years is that we love college coaching because of the ability that it gives you to affect people, young people, young people and their development and their character, their attitude as students, the importance of getting an education, the choices and decisions they make every day, seeing them develop the character, attitude, work ethic, perseverance, overcoming adversity, pride in performance, all the things that are important for them to become good <coughs> football players, and also seeing them go out and being successful. You know, as I coach in the National Football League, almost every team we played had guys on it that played for us in college. We played New England, they'd have two or three guys, whether it's Jarvis Green or whatever, we played the Buffalo Bills, you know, they had three or four guys, uh, Josh Reed, Cal Williams. I, but what the self-gratification that gave me is that I helped those guys fulfill their dreams when I was a college coach. And that was important to me. And 
That's why I wanted to come back to college. My heart's here. I love it here. Uh, I like to affect people, and that's why we're here. And this obviously is one of the best places in the country to have an opportunity to do that. Obviously, what we want to do right now is first thing we need to do is hire good staff. I think having good people is the most important thing you can do in having a successful program. There's a lot of good people here that we would like to, to get to know, and we will have to hire a coaching staff. We'll interview the coaching staff that's here, see if there's anybody that we would has the characteristics that we're looking for that would contribute to the kind of staff that we want to want to have. And the second order of business will be to try to pull together the recruiting class uh, in terms of where we are with the players that we're recruiting, those that are committed, uh, and any other players that aren't committed uh, that we might be able to get involved with in the very near future. So with that being said, any questions? Yes. Coach, uh, you talked a little bit about how you, uh, the, the way you were received yesterday at the airport and here at the football complex. Have you ever experienced anything like that before, and did that solidify that you made the right choice? Well, it certainly was, um, there was a lot of positive self-gratification for me to know that the people here appreciated the fact that I was going to be the coach here. You know, when I went to LSU, I was at Michigan State. Nobody really knew much about me then. Um, and there was the equipment man, Jimmy over here, and me. That's it. That was the, that, that's who met the plane. So uh, there was a lot more enthusiasm and energy out there yesterday, and it was certainly welcome, and uh, we appreciate it. And I want the people that uh, came out there and do that to know that we appreciated it. There's a lot in the back. Coach, you talked a little bit about your staff. Uh, Melissa Lee, ABC 3340 from Birmingham. You talked a little bit about your staff. A lot of um, rumors, <laughs> even though you've been named the head coach, that, that rumor is done. Um, but some of the rumors out there are that Jimbo Fisher might return uh, and, and be, once again be on your staff. Will he be on your staff once again or possibly uh, Coach Trickett? Well, there's a lot of um, coaches out there that have coached with me before that we would be interested in having on our staff here. Uh, that have a track record of being successful in whatever their responsibility has been. You know, Jimbo's certainly one of those guys, but I am not going to specifically comment because of the circumstances that they're in right now and their jobs that would jeopardize a protocol that we would need to go through professionally uh, to make it happen with any coach that we were interested in. Uh, so I, 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 I'm not going to make specific comments to individuals. When we hire somebody, we'll let you know. I mean, we'll announce it so you, you'll know first. Coach Saban, Kerry Clark, Commercial Dispatch. Could you go over quickly the type of offense you plan to run and the type of defense you plan to run here? Well, first of all, um, being a defensive guy, we've always run the same scheme on defense. I don't think that getting technically into it, anybody would um, um, understand. But uh, we play a 3-4 over and under, aggressive style, a uh, lot of pressure, a lot of, lot of blitzing. Uh, a lot of man-to-man -man coverage in the secondary, try to play close coverage. You know, when I went to LSU the, the, the first uh, time, they had a Bengal Bells group there, which was the women. It was the women's quarterback club. And the first time I went to address that group, they were asking questions like this, what kind of offense, what kind of defense, and all that. But the first question, there was a lady that was about 70 years old. She was about this high. She was all the way in the back of the room, reminded me of my grandmother, and I'm thinking these ladies are going to ask me questions like, does anybody bake cookies for the guys on Thursday night before the game? And this little, this little lady gets up and she says, are we going to get up and play any close coverage on these people? Or are we going to be off and let them catch the ball in front like I've been seeing around here for the last four years? <laughs> I said, we're in the right spot here now. We got <laughs> we're getting coached up on the secondary. <laughs> so, but uh, that's the style we'd like to play on defense. Offensively, um, you know, we, we've always wanted to have balance in the offense. I think it's important to stop the run when you're playing defense, but I also think it's important to be able to run the football effectively, uh, dominate the line of scrimmage, but having balance and being able to make explosive plays. Passing efficiency, really important on third down. It's really important in making explosive plays. Explosive plays are important in scoring points. So those are all things that we want to try to create here in terms of the balance that we have on offense 
running and throwing the football. I also think it's very important that you use the players that you have. You utilize the players that you have. You know, I, I, I hate to start telling stories up here, but, you know, you're getting me wound up. But, you know, when I was in high school in West Virginia, we played uh, Mason Town Valley. I was a sophomore, 15 years old, played quarterback. And we were playing at Mason Town Valley. The school was here. You had to walk through the graveyard. The lights were bad. You get to the field. You go play. And we're both third and fifth in the, in the state. So whoever wins the game is getting in the playoffs. In those days, only the top two teams got in. So... We get behind 18 nothing. walk through the graveyard, go in at halftime, come out through the graveyard. We get 18 to 12. We got a minute 27 to go in the game, and we get the ball back. And Coach Keener doesn't call any plays. I call every play. He made Coach of the Year eight years, and I call every play as a 15-year-old high school kid. <laughs> so we get down to fourth and 12 at the 25-yard line. One time out left, take it, and everybody in the town where I grew up is at the game. Every guy, every person. Last guy turned the lights out go to the game I'm saying thank goodness coach Keener is going to call this play because then I won't get blamed for calling the wrong play so I say coach where do you want to run here he says what do you think and I said I think you should call this one it's the last play of the game and he says I tell you what he said you got a three-time all-state split end out there and you got the left halfbacks the fastest guy in the state he says I don't care what play you call just make sure one of those two guys get the ball so I called 26 crossbar pass, threw it to left halfback, faked it to him, threw a post corner of the X, 25-yard touchdown, and we won the game, 19-18. But after the game, he told me this. He says, it really doesn't make any difference what plays you call sometimes. It's what players you have doing it. So I remember that. So on offense, I think sometimes that is, that's important, and I think it's important to have playmakers and skilled players who can make a difference in making explosive plays. Coach, Steve Cartoonin from 7 News in Miami. In the past, you've been quoted as saying, the best way to disrespect someone is to just walk away from them. By your own definition, do you feel like you disrespected the Dolphins organization or their fans, and is there anything you'd like to say to them? Well, I, I think that the two years I was in Miami, that I affected the team in a positive way. I mean, we were a 4-12 and team that was $17 million over the salary cap, and I think even though the misfortunes of this season, whether it's Ricky Williams' suspension, Dante Culpepper not being able to play because of uh, his knee injury, uh, Ronnie Brown getting hurt halfway through the season when he was starting to roll well. Whatever those misfortunes were, we came up a little bit short in how many games that we won. All right, but I think the team is closer to being successful now, and I think that the salary cap is in much better condition, and I think they have all their draft choices, so they're better off than they were now. Uh, my commitment to that organization, and it was premature, you know, to not stay there, all right? But if I knew, and Wayne and I talked about this, that my heart was to go back to college. And I think everybody should understand that I wasn't going to take this job, all right? And I called Wayne on December 23rd when I went to the Miami Dolphins and said, I don't think I can do this. It's too emotional. I'm a college coach. I want to stay in college. And he came back on Christmas Eve the next morning and talked me into going, all right? And I gave my best effort for two years to do that. And I think the organization and the team is better for that. And it was premature for me to leave. Uh, but at the same time, if I knew that my heart was someplace else in terms of what I wanted to do, I don't think it would have been fair to the organization if I stayed. And that's what Wayne and I talked about. We communicated, and we both kind of agreed that that would be the best thing that we could do. Coach. Well, I want to hire the best staff that we possibly can, okay? And uh, we've already started, you know, to hire some people. Uh, we've got some other people coming in, but I don't think hiring a staff is something that you really put a timetable on. When you're trying to get the best people, uh, there's a process and a procedure that you have to go through, uh, and we're not going to take shortcuts to uh, hire somebody because once you get married to them, you know, you, they're, they're here. You know, you're with them. So I'd rather get the best people, do the due diligence that we have to do to get the best people, and then end up having the best quality of staff, recruiting staff, coaching staff, teaching staff that we possibly can. So we want to do it as quickly as possible, all right, but we also want to do it as efficiently and effectively as possible to get the best product. Coach Saban Cecil Herb from the Tuscaloosa News. Uh, just as a follow-up, when did you 
initially become aware that, that there was an opportunity at Alabama, and what was your initial emotional reaction upon, upon hearing that? Well, obviously the timetable for me was um, there was interest. Um, after Coach Shula was uh, dismissed, uh, I was in the season to, and said that I was not interested because my commitment w and focus was to our team and our players to give them the best opportunity to win each week. And somebody else got hired, all right? And that was, that was fine. Um, and then for a long time, nothing happened. And the assumption was made that there was some interest on my part. But I stayed focused to our team all right, and what we needed to do each week to give our team the best chance to be successful. And I'm quite frankly proud uh, that our team beat New England uh, and played two really good football games against the Jets in Indianapolis uh, even though we came up short during that time. And that was my focus and that was the, the process that I went through. Not until after the Indianapolis game did Jimmy tell me that there was an opportunity here that uh, people were interested in me here specifically, all right, and that um, the possibility of me being the coach here did exist. Uh, and not until about 6 o'clock on Monday uh, after the Indianapolis game uh, did I decide to talk to Mao talk to him on the phone. I never had a meeting with him, just talk to him on the phone. So uh, that's kind of the sequence of events for me. That's the timetable. Uh, Terry and I decided after talking to Mile that we would think about this. We thought about it for a day and uh, made a decision that uh, this is where our heart was and uh, this is what we wanted to do. And it's a great challenge, a great institution, and we're certainly happy to be here. Well, let me just say this. My next stop, you know where Lake Burton is? It's in North Georgia, right on the North Carolina border, Rabin County. All right, it's a lake. It's where they made Deliverance, if you ever saw the movie. All right, that's where I go in the summertime. That's where I like it, and that's my next stop. All right, so as long as the people here are committed to trying to win, I'm going to want to be the coach here, and at some point in time, maybe somebody else can do it better. And if that time comes, that's where I'm going, Lake Burton. They don't have a football team there. we got a pontoon boat, though, a good one. <coughs> so. Coach Saban, uh, Kirk McMahon, Alabama Magazine. Do you, uh, did you have any conversations with any previous Alabama head coaches? And if so, uh, could you share any of that? Yes. Um, I talked to uh, Gene Stallings. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Coach Stallings, who – um, I know I've had a few stops along the way, but when I was a head coach at Michigan State, he spoke at our clinic. Um, I knew him when he was in the professional ranks as a secondary coach at Dallas, as well as a head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. Um, so then when I was at LSU, we had him speak at our clinic at LSU. So we had a history of talking ball, uh, being around each other. Um, when I got the Bear Bryant Award to be coach for Coach of the Year, uh, Coach Stallings was there. Uh, and we sat together with Kenny Stabler, and um, so we, you know, there was some storytelling going on in that bunch. Um, so I, I did think that um, after I talked to Mao on Monday or Tuesday, I don't know which day it was, uh, I did talk, talk to Coach St Stallings and just ask his opinion right, of what he thought about um, this coaching opportunity. And uh, he was very candid. We had a great discussion. Uh, he obviously had a tremendous amount of success here and won the national, national championship. Um, and it was helpful to uh, myself and Terry in making this decision. Coach Tom Murphy, Mobile Press Register, right here. Um, you've had some heated battles against Alabama in your past at LSU. I recall the postgame 2002 in Baton Rouge. I'm wondering what your impressions were of Alabama when you were there and, and since then? How come you only bring up the game you won? <laughs> we, we won four. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, that, that was a very good football team that Alabama had that, that year. And, um, you know, like always, you know, it's unfortunate when things get posted that aren't true. You know, I never said anything bad about the 
uh, University of Alabama after the Kentucky game and, uh, or anything like that, and that was the motivating factor for their team. I think they had a better team than us, and um, they certainly played well that day and, and beat us, and I think Coach Fran is an outstanding coach and did a very good job here to win 10 games with that team. Um, but, you know, it's unfortunate that um, things that get that are rumor and innuendo and maybe aren't true, once they get out, you can't control them, even if they aren't true, and it affects people's relationship. I think that's unfortunate. Nick, Josh Cooper, Decatur Daily. Um, what do you know about the team that you're about to start coaching the program, and are you going to be making any sort of changes to practices or and I don't think there's any reason because we're going to compete against each other that that program from the student.